Do you think they had TMZ in the Middle Ages? Well, I can tell you the answer to that, and it's no. But they definitely had celebrities. If you were alive in the mid to late 12th century, especially if you lived in the Rhineland, and especially if you were part of the church, chances are you would have heard of this woman. In fact, you may have even heard of her in the present day. If so, you probably know her music. Most modern celebrities could only dream that people would still be listening to their tracks almost 850 years after their deaths. But this particular woman wasn't best known for her music until fairly recently. Instead, she was known for her visions. And I don't mean that she was ambitious, I mean that she was known for being a holy woman who received visions from God. I'm speaking, of course, about Hildegard of Bingen. Hildegard was born sometime in the summer of 1098. Her parents, Hildebert and Mechthild, were part of the lower nobility in the area of the Rhineland near Mainz, part of the Holy Roman Empire in today's Germany, and seem to have been connected to the court of the Counts of Sponheim. Hildegard was their tenth child, and was dedicated to the church at around eight years old. This isn't too surprising, given her position in line for inheritance and dowries, but also since she was often sick throughout her life, and may have been so as a child as well, and the church would have been able to take care of her. According to her vita, her hagiography, that is, the biography of a holy person, she'd started having visions at a young age, but she stopped sharing them when she realized that not everyone was seeing them too, and the vita says that her early visions are what led her parents to give her to the church. Anyway, she would eventually become a companion to the teenage Jutta von Sponheim, sister of Count Meganhard, to whom Hildegard's parents likely owed some loyalty. Jutta was extremely devout, and after a period of learning, she dedicated herself to a drastic lifestyle as an anchoress at the monastery of Disebodenberg. Now, Disebodenberg was a male Benedictine monastery, but for what Jutta was doing, this wasn't a problem. An anchoress, or anchorite if it's a man, is someone who devoted their life entirely to prayer and would essentially lock themselves up in a room with no interaction with the outside world, except through a window where they would receive food, pass out buckets of, well, waste, and could also speak to those who came to see them. This could be a priest for the Eucharist or confession, but because this lifestyle was so extreme, many anchoresses and anchorites got a reputation as holy people, and pilgrims or other guests would often come to request blessings. When Jutta was enclosed, she was around 20 and Hildegard 14, and Hildegard actually joined her alongside another girl, also named Jutta. So Hildegard was meant to live the rest of her life in that room alongside the two Juttas, but things didn't go so typically. Most anchorites were entirely solitary, so already the situation with Hildegard was a little exceptional, but things would change even more because of Jutta's reputation. As I mentioned, anchorites often got reputations as very holy people, and Yuta was no exception. She even received letters and gave people life advice. At the same time, she taught Hildegard and other Yuta the Psalms, in Latin of course, and possibly some scripture. Eventually, some visitors would ask Yuta to take in their daughters into her little community, which she and the abbot of Disebodenberg accepted, and the anchorite cell was opened, becoming a sort of mini-nunnery. When Jutta died in 1136 at the age of 44, Hildegard, then 38, was chosen as the community's new leader, their magistra, or mistress. By then, they numbered around 10. Hildegard quickly obtained a similar reputation to Jutta, though she was less intense than her predecessor was. This, on its own, would have made her rather famous, but at the age of 42, something happened which would change her trajectory forever. Hildegard received a particularly intense vision, where, as she puts it, God revealed to her a powerful understanding of theology and commanded her to write it down and share it with the world. At first, she was hesitant, but at the insistence of her confessor, the monk Folmar, and one of her nuns, Richardis von Stade, she began to write the book which would eventually be known as Scivias. This was Hildegard's first of three books on theology, and, like the others, it was, for the most part, a collection of descriptions of her visions, which had both visual and auditory components, followed by elaborate and in-depth explanations as to the meaning of the visions. And because she's describing visions sent to her by God, Hildegard rarely narrates in her own voice. 
She consistently states that she's ignorant and unlearned with poor Latin, and that everything she writes is from God. And her Latin was pretty basic. She likely learned it entirely from reciting the Psalms under Utah. Throughout her life, she actually had Fulmar, her confessor, correct her Latin and put it to parchment. And after he died in 1173, she had others do it, though she complained on occasion that they weren't as good as Fulmar, and she didn't like the way they changed some of her language, so she had it redone. In around 1151, as her community doubled in number, Hildegard, not without difficulty, managed to convince the abbot to let her leave Dissebodenburg and establish a new monastery on the Rhine at Rupertsburg, right near the town of Bingen, hence why she's known as Hildegard of Bingen. She was technically still magistra, not abbess. She was formerly still under the authority of the abbot of Dissebodenburg, but at Rupertsburg she had a lot more freedom to grow and guide her community as she wished, and she continued to write and grow in fame until her death on September 17th, 1179, at the age of 81. As to what her writings were about, well, each work could be a whole series of videos on its own, but I'll do my best to summarize. Like I mentioned, Hildegard wrote three works on theology, and this is really what she was known for at the time. In them, she discusses many things, but one thing she was very concerned with was virtue. She frequently describes visions of the virtues personified and their conquests of vices and of sin. For her, humility was the most important virtue, which is likely tied to the way she insisted on her own ignorance. Now, there are debates as to how ignorant and uneducated Hildegard really was. Her works touch on ideas from known authors like Augustine, Boethius, and Cicero, and even some more contemporary works, but whether that's because she had read them or because she'd been introduced to those ideas less formally through the words of others, possibly through sermons or simple conversation, is hard to tell. It would have been possible for her to learn, since she was a Benedictine nun who had a deep respect and familiarity with the rule of St. Benedict, the rule which determined how Benedictines were meant to conduct their lives. And the rule specifically devotes a few hours during the day to reading, which could include biblical commentaries and saints' lives, but it also allows the abbot, or in her case, especially after moving to Rupertsburg, the magistra, to add other appropriate books to the list, and it wasn't uncommon for monks and nuns to read philosophy, theology, and even the poetry of ancient Roman authors like Virgil and Juvenal. In fact, other holy women of the 12th century were usually praised for their love of learning, though Hildegard's early life in the church under Utah wasn't the most typical. But anyway, back to the theology. Hildegard was very concerned with moral reform. She was concerned about corruption in the church, especially on the personal level. She believed, as was typical at the time, that the church's problems, and really the world's problems, were caused by moral corruption, and she encouraged people to embrace a simple, moderate, and humble lifestyle guided by virtue, and to reflect on their moral deficiencies in order to correct them. Because of this, she was never afraid to criticize or chastise people in power for their moral shortcomings, seeing the vices of those in positions of authority as directly linked to the rise of the Cathar heresy, which was growing in prominence at the time. Humans played a central role in the battle between God and the devil, and the church, through liturgy and the sacraments, was humanity's guide to fighting the devil instead of aiding him. It was through virtues that humanity would counter vices and sin, and ultimately achieve salvation. Now, like I said, there's more to it than I can really cover in one video, but this is one of the bigger themes throughout her works. Another one is the emphasis she placed on the connection between the human being and the rest of the universe. Hildegard saw the human as both spiritual and worldly. In order to have a proper relationship with God, one had to be aware of the fact that they were both connected to him, but also his creation, both elevated and base. One's faith and also their acts upon creation were both part of the path towards salvation. To reject the spiritual aspect of humanity is to reject God. To reject the worldly is to lack that important virtue of humility. For Hildegard, this was especially manifested in the fact that her visions were often accompanied by a great deal of pain, which has led some to conclude that her visions were caused by migraines, but today's historians are a lot more cautious about making these kinds of retroactive diagnoses. Another reminder of humility was the fact that these visions were given to her, a woman, 
Hildegard, like most medieval people, saw women as weak, frail, and more prone to sin. The reputation she has in some circles as a proto-feminist is not, in my opinion, all that appropriate. Because of this idea of a human-slash-nature connection, Hildegard plays a lot with an idea that was becoming quite widespread at the time, that the body was a microcosm of the universe. Humanity was central to God's creation, and the whole universe was reflected in its body. This comes out especially in her medical works, which is where I first learned about her when studying medieval medicine as an undergrad. These are the Physica and Causa et Cure, both of which can be quite different in some ways from the rest of her works, and for a long time there was doubt as to whether she actually wrote them. But these days their legitimacy is recognized. But it's still widely assumed that what we have is an expansion on a work she wrote which was originally more focused on nature and the human more generally, and discussed diseases and the medicinal properties of things as a part of that. In some regards, they seem like typical medical works. She writes about the humors and certain qualities inherent in nature, typically hot, cold, wet, and dry, though Hildegard is more focused on hot and cold, and she adds others like foaminess and greenness. For example, saying that moss is created from the inner greenness of a tree leaking to the surface once it's been weakened. But in typical Hildegardian fashion, she also notes how the fall of man is what caused the imbalance of the body's humors, and therefore disease, because it led to vice amongst them, with the submissive humors becoming envious of the dominant ones and seeking to overthrow them. She also notes how God planted curative properties within his creation so that humans could use them to restore balance, therefore connecting disease with vice and health with salvation. She also takes many opportunities to note parallels between nature and man, the microcosm-macrocosm dichotomy that I mentioned. The fibers of plants, for example, are like veins, stones are like bones, and birds, with their airy nature and elevated place in the sky, are a reflection of the soul, once again placing humanity thoroughly and centrally within creation. It's likely that Hildegard's original work was split in two and added on to, either later in her life or after her death, likely with her consent and possibly even at her request, in order to make it more like a typical work of medicine. Though which parts are hers originally and which ones are added is not entirely agreed upon. But even for the parts that most people agree to be hers, it's clear that Hildegard had a fair amount of knowledge, at least about vernacular medical practices, though some of them could have been her own original extrapolations. This is likely due to the fact that monasteries were expected to be places where some healing took place. Not only does the rule of St. Benedict say that the community is expected to care for their own sick members, but it was also very common for monasteries to have their own infirmaries open to all, serving as the main place of medical assistance for local communities. It's likely that Hildegard's nuns frequently helped the sick of nearby Bingen and possibly other towns in the area. But beyond vernacular cures, there are times when her advice follows other known works almost verbatim. For example, a few of her cures for menstrual issues and difficult births follow very closely to advice from the Trotula, the most famous medieval work on women's medicine. Hildegard places a lot of importance on women's health, which makes sense seeing as she was one and lived with at least 20 others, and she discusses women in their own right, rather than as a variation or derivation of men, as was more typical at the time. Hildegard was also known as a healer herself. In fact, she was quite famous for this. But the healing attributed to her was more of the spiritual or miraculous variety. Her touch, her words, even locks of her hair were said to cure disease on several occasions. She even exorcised several demons. In one case, a demon possessing a woman in Cologne for seven years told the local priests that Hildegard was the only one who could get rid of it, which she did after a vision revealed to her the proper ritual to do so. But although it might be easy for us today to distinguish between material and spiritual cures, these things weren't so distinct to people at the time. All cures ultimately derived their power from God, and medicine was often a combination of the two. One who shunned medical care and relied solely on prayer was seen as just as foolish as one who called for the physician but neglected his soul. Of course, miraculous cures were more likely to grow Hildegard's reputation, but it was the combination of these, her writings, her visions, and her miracles, which made her the celebrity she was.
The vessel for the celebrity, however, was without a doubt her letters, of which we have over 300 which survived to us. Like I mentioned, Hildegard was not afraid to chastise people for their shortcomings, and we know about this because of her letters. Many people from all walks of life, both those who read some of her works and those who heard about her through word of mouth, wrote to Hildegard for advice, which she gave, though she wasn't afraid to point out, sometimes very frankly, where people needed to improve in rooting out vices, especially when writing to abbots and other members of the clergy, which made up the majority of her correspondence. She also received requests for prayers and information on someone's future or the fate of a departed loved one. In the case of those last two, she sometimes gave answers, but more often she noted how her visions rarely revealed those kinds of things, essentially saying that she's not a fortune teller. And when I say all walks of life, I do mean all walks of life. Obviously, those who wrote to her were literate or had access to a scribe, but amongst them we have clergy, from parish priests to popes, four popes in fact, as well as merchants, nobles, and even several monarchs, including Henry II of England, Eleanor of Aquitaine, Bertha or Irene of Greece, and two of her own sovereigns, Conrad III and Frederick Barbarossa. King Conrad praised Hildegard's wisdom and requested advice on how to rule as a Christian king, to which she replied that he'd been going astray from God's justice and that he must return to it, adding that he needed to restrain his pleasures and correct himself in order to be purified and not be cut off from the kingdom of heaven. Barbarossa, Conrad's nephew and successor, mentions in his letter that Hildegard had actually met him in person when he held court in Ingelheim, which is only about a three hours walk from Bingen, and that everything she'd prophesied had come true. He also said that he'd take her advice on a matter she'd discussed with him, and promised he would judge without partiality, whether due to friendship or hatred. Though Hildegard and Barbarossa's relationship was complicated, especially since he supported three antipopes during a schism from 1159 to 1177, something which Hildegard was extremely critical of. Meeting her in person was a possible alternative, either by visiting Disbordenburg and later Rupertsburg, or during one of her several preaching tours between 1158 and 71. Which, by the way, is interesting both considering that Hildegard started her church career expecting to live her whole life confined to a single room, and because public preaching by women was rarely allowed at the time. For the illiterate, this would have been their only means of interacting with her. And even amongst the literate, there were many who met her this way. But for some, the letters themselves were the most prized. The abbot of Ilbenstadt, for example, met her in person, but in a later letter, he reminds her that she promised during their meeting to send him one. It should be noted that in the Middle Ages, letters weren't just private things. In fact, they were usually very public. They would have been copied and shared as soon as they were received, and we have tons of manuscripts containing some of Hildegard's letters, in addition to an official compilation collected and edited by someone in Hildegard's own circle. Having a letter written to you by Hildegard was essentially putting your name onto a piece of her legacy, especially since Hildegard's letters were some of her most widely circulated writings. I like to compare her letters to something like Twitter. You might be tweeting, at someone in particular, but it's a platform where the expectation is that a lot more people are going to be reading it than just that one person. Otherwise, you'd just DM them. I mean, I assume. I don't actually use Twitter, or X, but that's my understanding of it. She also sent some people her works to read and give their opinions on, especially early on before the completion of Scivias. In fact, one of the big things which legitimized her visions was the approval of Bernard of Clairvaux, the other biggest celebrity of the day, after she requested that he read what she'd written so far to determine whether her gift was truly divine, which he said it was. Supposedly, he then sent it to Pope Eugenius III at a council in Trent, and the Pope sent Hildegard a letter giving his approval. But for a variety of reasons, which I won't get into right now, many historians think this letter was a later fabrication. Now, significantly, there wasn't any opposition either. Although some people disagreed on occasion or took issue with some of Hildegard's practices at her monastery, no one ever accused her of being a fraud or being influenced by the devil. It seems that there was a kind of informal approval by the church as a whole, and possibly even by Pope Eugenius, certainly by the secular rulers of the Holy Roman Empire. And this letter was likely fabricated to make it more explicit either late in Hildegard's life or after her death, as her supporters were arguing for her sainthood. 
This is important considering that this was a time when the church was extremely focused on heresy and orthodoxy. The Cathar movement was around and the Waldensians would emerge in the last decade of Hildegard's life, both of whom criticized the church and claimed direct divine authority. Why Hildegard was accepted while others were condemned is probably because of a combination of factors, but I think one of the biggest is that Hildegard didn't reject the church. She saw it as an important, the most important, vehicle towards salvation. Individuals within it were corrupt, yes, but that was a matter of one's own sins, which made her views much more similar to the proponents of the Gregorian reforms, which were still very fresh, than to those accused of heresy. In that regard, Hildegard was a beacon of what most powerful churchmen strove to be, a model for emulation, the kind of person God might genuinely make into a prophet. Hildegard's life was also steeped in established tradition. As I mentioned, she was a Benedictine nun, and she was familiar with the rule of St. Benedict, which she even wrote a commentary on. The rule set the tempo for a Benedictine's day-to-day -day life, but as I mentioned with readings, it leaves some leeway at the discretion of the abbot. And this finally brings us to what Hildegard is most famous for today, her music. The rule of St. Benedict requires that its followers meet for prayer eight times a day, during matins, about an hour before sunrise, lauds at dawn, prime, one hour after sunrise, terse, three hours after sunrise, sext, six, and non, nine, vespers around sunset, and compline after dark, not long before bed. This is known as the divine office or liturgy of the hours. The rule also requires that all of the 150 psalms in the Bible be recited every week, which meant that a few psalms would be sung during each of these hours. This is why Hildegard learnt the psalms from a young age, and in fact, it was expected that clergy who performed the divine office would memorize all 150 of them. Also, the psalms were always sung in the Middle Ages, not spoken. Now, the rule gives the general form of the hours, specifying which prayers open and close which hour, which ones include hymns, when and where to sing versicles, stuff like that. But they also allow for leeway in terms of adorning, you could say, the liturgy. If you look at Hildegard's music, you'll see that a lot of the pieces are labeled as antiphons and responsories, and that's because these were the most common types of adornments for the liturgy where there was the most leeway. Antiphons were sung before and after the psalms. During some hours, you might sing antiphons between each psalm, but for others, or on busier days, it was common to have one opening antiphon, followed by all the psalms back to back, and a closing antiphon. Responsories were sung in response to a reading, which could be from the Bible or a saint's life, usually depending on the day. This happened during matins, and also during mass, which was separate from the divine office. Hildegard wrote several pieces devoted to specific saints, including St. Rupert, the patron of Rupertsburg, which would have been recited on special feast days. Hildegard was hardly the only monastic leader writing music for her community at the time. Now, not every abbess or abbot was doing so, many of them simply carried on the music that they inherited or borrowed from other communities, but the writing of liturgical music wasn't unusual for someone in her position. But Hildegard's music evokes her visionary experiences as most of her other works did. The sound is heavenly and the lyrics are full of vivid imagery. And like the rest of her works, Hildegard attributed the content of her music to the Holy Spirit working through her, rather than her own creativity. And while most of the music from the 12th century has been forever lost to time, Hildegard's works were preserved because of her fame. Her music was copied alongside her other works, and thanks to the presence of early musical notation called neumes, we know for the most part what it sounded like. Even before Hildegard's death in 1179, people were convinced that she was a saint. Her works were being spread across the Rhineland, copied in Benedictine houses and appreciated by intellectuals. Sometime between 1210 and 1231, her theological works were sent to the master theologians of the University of Paris, who enthusiastically confirmed that they were legitimate divine revelations. In 1220, a monk named Gebeno of Eberbach created a compilation of excerpts from her various works called the Pentachronon, mostly focused around her visions related to the end times and the last judgment, which became extremely popular and the main venue through which most people would know of Hildegard until the 17th century. Her canonization process began in 1228 under Pope Gregory IX, who was sure she was a saint, 
Ultimately, the process was stalled and didn't go anywhere, with several attempts to redo it throughout the centuries. But despite this, she was widely considered to be a saint by both the people of the Rhineland, but also many people in high positions within the church. In 2012, her canonization was confirmed by Pope Benedict in recognition of this fact, and shortly after, she was also given the honor of Doctor of the Church, one of only 37 people to hold that title as of this video's recording. This was in the wake of the revival of interest in Hildegard in the 20th century, which was especially focused on her music, and which led her to hold a canonical place in the study of music history and inspire modern singers and composers, especially in Germany, but also beyond. Hildegard of Bingen was an incredible woman, whose works are extremely fascinating. And as I've said, this video has only really scratched the surface. There's so much more that could be discussed. But that'll have to be for another time. As always, I thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.